Good morning. I hope you're joining us today. Uh, my name is Mark Lanier. This is our life group via the internet. And it's a marvelous, wonderful thing. I got a, a wonderful booklet after our Easter Sunday that was put together by Janet Seifert. And, and in it, it had, if, if we can hit uh, IPVO early, Brent, I, in it, it had this incredible map from the Easter service. Look at this map. I've, and I knew we were getting people who were watching from all over the world. I've gotten emails from Germany and from England and from South Africa and from Asia. And so a shout out to all of you who've been watching. And I said to Janet, so she's in charge of our internet. I said, uh, so did you do one of those internet maps of everybody who was watching? I was so encouraged. She said, no, that's just a map of the spread of the coronavirus. <laughs> so that was a deflating moment. But it is uh, with great uh, appreciation to all of you who are tuned in and watching as we do biblical study while living with corona. Now, this, I, I got, my mom sends me these pictures and, and these memes. I got some that I threw out for to class today. I don't know where you are in the midst of this. If you're the, I need to get out of this bed, I'm late for the couch type person. If you're the one who says quarantine has turned us all into dogs, we roam the house all day looking for food. We're told no if we get too close to strangers and we get really excited about car rides. Or perhaps you're the, it's like being 16 again, gas is cheap and I'm grounded. Uh, perhaps you find yourself with, I've spent two weeks hanging out with myself. And I'm so sorry to every person I've ever spent time with. Um, one of my favorites just saw a burglar kicking his own door in. I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm working from home. Uh, or perhaps you're the person who's glad you didn't waste your money buying a day planner for 2020. Regardless of where you land, a friend of our class and a dear friend of mine and Becky's is Phil Keggy, the musician extraordinaire, good Christian brother. He and his wife, Byrne, live in, in Nashville, Tennessee, and he's got a recording studio in his basement. And he's done songs for us for the last number of classes. Uh, he, he did um, uh, Germs on the Run from Paul McCartney and Wings Band on the Run. He did Don't Wanna Hold Your Hand off the Beatles, uh, uh, Wanna Hold Your Hand. Well, this week I've got a special song that he's done. It may be one of my favorites he's done yet. I'm not gonna play it till the end of class, but I'll give you a hint by telling you that it's uh, uh, from this iconic Beatles album of Abbey Road, and it will be Phil Keggy doing his best Paul McCartney impersonation. That's Phil, by the way, if you're looking on your right, Paul McCartney's on the left. I think that photo's from when Phil played the wedding of, at Paul McCartney's wife's sister, so Linda McCartney's sister's wedding. Um, and that's gonna be at the end of the class. But to get there, we've got a journey on the story on the road to Emmaus. And we've already started that journey from Luke 24 last week, but I told you this week we would have the story behind the story on the road to Emmaus. So that's what we're gonna look at is the story behind the story. Now, we're coming to you live this morning, unless you're watching us uh, uh, on a tape delay or something. But right now, we're live streaming around the world. It's 11.04 a.m. Central Time, which is, is also known as LMT, Lubbock Mean Time, because everybody ties a lot of things to Lubbock, Texas. But we're coming to you from a chapel that's a replica of one that was built over 1500 years ago. This is an exterior view of where we are right now at the Stone Chapel. This is the remains that were photographed by Madame Gertrude Bell in the early 1900s. These were the remains of the original chapel that was built in 500 AD in Tomarza, Turkey. Now Tomarza, Turkey is the red dot I've put on this uh, Google satellite view. 
it's just about two hours from Iconium, which is one of the Galatian churches that Paul missionized on his first missionary journey and then wrote the letter of Galatians to back 1950 years ago. So the original church was built there. This church is shaped like a cross because the foundation of the church, which is laid first, is the cross of Christ. And so we're going to use part of this church and that, that we've rebuilt, this replica that we've rebuilt, where I'm coming to you from as we talk about the story behind the story on the road to Emmaus. Now the passage of scripture that we want to hone in on is found in that Emmaus story. It's the Emmaus story, remember, two disciples of Jesus walking down the road on Easter Sunday. Jesus joins them. They don't recognize him for who he is. But Jesus joins them and says, hey, what's going on? And they said, well, are you coming from Jerusalem with us? Don't you know what's going on? Are you the only person that doesn't know what's going on? And Jesus said, well, tell me about it. So they told him about Jesus and, and he was a man powerful in word and deed and, 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 and what all he did and that he'd been crucified and that there were rumors, unconfirmed rumors, that he was resurrected. And at that point in time, these two apostles, or disciples, excuse me, did not know uh, that those rumors were true. <clears throat> and so Jesus begins to unfold to them something. And here's the key passage from the story. It's found in Luke 24, verse 27. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to those two individuals in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And so that's what we've got today, is we're going to look at that story behind the story. Jesus began with Moses and the prophets. And while we don't know with precision exactly what Jesus said on that uh, eight mile journey, we can know what the Bible has taught us about Moses and the prophets and what they say about Jesus and his ministry. So through the great help of Brent Johnson, who does this with us, as I walk a little bit off that camera, I've got uh, Brent's camera here, and it's been sanitized so I can do this, but I want to show you a bit of this chapel. And so we can go to the chapel itself, and you'll see in the ceiling of the chapel that we have painted these, these uh, vignettes, these stories, and from the doors that open up to bring you into the chapel, all the way up to this center arch that's in top of me, all of these are Old Testament stories of the prophets bearing witness to Jesus. I'm gonna take us to the second arch today. And this second arch is the Moses arc, for lack of anything better to say. And it begins with the story of the Egyptians in slavery. And it goes to Moses being uh, uh, on the run from the Egyptian authorities as Moses goes and, and ultimately encounters God in a burning bush. And Moses returns to bring the people out of bondage through uh, Passover, Pesach in the Hebrew. And we've got that, let me get the light fixture out of the way. And then we'll talk about the Israelites being released as they go on their journey to the promised land. And in the process of that journey, they have to cross the Red Sea. And let's talk about that crossing the Red Sea. Let's flip to the other side and let's see the manna from heaven that's sent to them. We'll see the water that God calls through Moses out of a rock to, to give them drink. We'll see Moses receiving the Ten Commandments, the building of the tabernacle, the tent that is used to follow God and worship him, and then the people finally going into the promised land. So with that, I'll return to my place up here, and we'll teach through those vignettes with a special thank you to Brent Johnson for making that work. Um, by the way, there are a few people who are allowed in here, but they're social distancing and their family one way or the other. So with that, let's talk about 
the stories of Moses as Moses relayed through prophetic life. Get this. He's living his life in God's will most of the time. He's living his life in God's will. And God uses his life circumstances to prophetically proclaim what Jesus would be, how Jesus would live, and what Jesus would do. And so within the framework of Jesus being the Messiah, that story actually starts before Moses, but since Luke says that Jesus started with Moses, we'll start there. The first vignette that I've got for you is the tyranny of sin. The Israelites had been put into bondage by Pharaoh and his people. They had started out as, as uh, um, voluntary refugees. I mean, voluntary refugees when they started in Egypt. But a Pharaoh arose who didn't know that and, and didn't care about that. And over time, for a period of about 400 years, the, the Israelites, they grew and prospered but they became property of Pharaoh. They were his chattel. They were his workforce, his slave labor. And so as being enslaved in labor, it was a bitter and harsh enslavement. They couldn't get out. They could not leave. They did not have it within themselves to escape slavery. Pharaoh had the ability to kill their children. He decided they were getting too numerous. He kills the male children. Moses is spared by the hand of God working through his mother and through a daughter of Pharaoh. But, but Pharaoh and the enslavement of the Israelites was something that for hundreds of years no one could solve. There was no release. Paul says in his letter to the church at Rome that just as the Israelites were enslaved to Pharaoh, we see an image of ourselves. In Romans 6, Paul says it over and over that we were slaves to sin. Sin is something to which we're enslaved. He said, you once presented your members. He's talking to the believers before they became faithful believers in, in the Messiah. You presented your members as slaves to impurity, slaves to lawlessness. And all it led to was more lawlessness. I got to tell you, that is a lesson that deals directly with the mission and purpose of Jesus. Moses walked among and was one of people enslaved to Pharaoh as I am enslaved to sin, absent God intervening and rescuing me from that slavery. You leave Mark Lanier to Mark Lanier. Don't let God enter the picture. And I'm not only a sinner, I continue to sin. And the sin begat sin begat sin. Oh, I might be able to polish it. I might be able to hide it. I might be able to pretend I'm not envious of others or pretend I don't have pride. I can even write the book, Humility, and how I achieved it. But it doesn't matter. I'm still a slave to sin, absent the redemptive hand of God. Now, the next vignette that we've got painted is one of Moses at the burning bush. So Moses has killed an Egyptian, and he's gone on the run, and he's gotten out into the wilderness, and as he's on the lamb, he becomes a shepherd. Uh, he's got a father-in-law, Jethro, and, and he's married one of Jethro's daughters, and he's helping take care of Jethro's goats. And, and as a shepherd, a, a, a herder of these goats, he's out with the goats on Mount Sinai. And he sees a bush that's being burned. But the bush is not being consumed. It's really just a flame. It's a fire that's coming from the bush without consuming the bush. Moses thinks, I got to check this out. 
And he goes over and God stops him before he gets to the bush. God calls him Moses, Moses. He says, yes, take off your sandals. What you use to navigate this world and what you use to walk in and what you have as your every day is not suitable for approaching the holiness of God. The ground that you're standing on is kadosh in Hebrew. It's holy. It's set apart. It's higher than anything you've ever been before. It is more devoted to, to purity and rightness. You are in the presence of the Almighty. You have no right to come in wearing your normal attire. The holiness of God is something that's serious. It's something that's real. And that lesson is to be learned. So with that lesson learned of the holiness of God, God calls Moses. He says, I want you to go back. I want you to talk to, to Pharaoh. And I want you to tell Pharaoh, God says, let my people go. Moses says, well, I, I, I'm, I'm not equipped to do that. Moses didn't understand that, that something that's critical here. If I want to be released from the slavery of sin, or if the Israelites want to be released from the slavery of Pharaoh, there's not a human being who's equipped to do that. You can go to every counselor in the world. You can go to every therapist in the world. You can say, man, I'm just really struggling with sin. I'm struggling with holiness. I'm not what I need to be. I'm not doing what I need to do. And there's not a, well, they, they may be able to help you with your alcoholism if you go to AA, but even there, in those 12 steps of AA or Narcotics Anonymous or Overeaters Anonymous or any of the 12 step programs, you're looking for a higher deity to help you conquer the sin. That's just the simple facts. There's not a human that's good enough to pull that off. So when Moses says to God, I, I can't do that. I don't have the wherewithal. God says, hey, what are you holding in your hand? Moses said, a stick. God said, throw the stick down. Moses throws the stick down. It becomes a serpent. God says, pick the stick up. Moses picks the stick up. It becomes a stick. God says to Moses, yeah, Moses, you're probably not good enough to pull this off. But your stick is as long as I'm the one doing the work. What Moses didn't understand was it was going to take the power of God to pull this off, and he could use a stick as much as Moses. So Moses and his Moses is just responsible at this point for carrying the stick. I mean, he takes the stick, sticks the stick in the Nile, and the Nile turns red, waves the stick over the land, and the plagues come across the land. God is the one who's doing this. It's all about God. God is holy, but Pharaoh doesn't listen to God. Pharaoh himself is a god, according to Egyptian theology. And so Pharaoh doesn't listen as the plagues tick off. Plague one, plague two, plague three, plague four, plague five. All of these plagues where God is conquering the local deities of the Egyptians. Until you get to the tenth plague. And that's the death of the firstborn. That takes us to our next vignette. It's the Passover. So the Passover is a time where God says, I am going to visit the angel of death upon the Egyptians and then Pharaoh will let you go. But you cannot have redemption from sin. You can't have redemption from the slavery of sin without death. There has to be a dying to sin. Now, God's got to bring the Israelites out. So God makes a provision for the Israelites to be redeemed from their slavery without it costing the Israelites their life. How does he do it? He tells them to take a lamb 
that is unblemished, without fault, pure, white, and to sacrifice and kill that lamb. Then take the blood from the pure, unblemished lamb and paint it on the doorways of their homes, but not just in any pattern. Paint it across the top and paint it out the sides in the shape of a cross. And so that blood is painted on the doors and God says, when the angel of death comes, when I see the blood of the pure lamb on you and your house, the angel of death will pass over. And this is how you'll get freed from the slavery of Pharaoh or sin, is by the blood of the lamb. Paul brings this to the Corinthians' attention in a book, 1 Corinthians, one of his letters to the churches there. 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Paul says, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. This is very clearly a prophetic image of, of, of the most clear type of Jesus a lamb who is without blemish. Remember, when Jesus starts his ministry, John the Baptist points at him and says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I was a slave to sin. I needed release. There wasn't a human who could free me from my sinful nature. But glory be to God, who took a Passover lamb, who took an innocent, Jesus, God himself made man, whose blood was shed so that death need not visit me in my journey to spiritual freedom. And that's to our next vignette, God's redemption. The Israelites were let go by Pharaoh they marched out. The vignette that we've got painted in the ceiling includes one of them carrying the bones of Joseph. Joseph had told him not to leave his bones there. My wife was talking to me about this last week as something that was uh, significant to her that, you know, we, we live in a house where she's pretty organized. She could probably find them. But if you told me, you got to leave town and, and, and you got to leave in the next couple of hours. And oh, by the way, go find Joseph's bones from 400 years ago because we need to cart them out of here. I'd be like, man, 400 years, where did I leave those bones? I'd have trouble finding them. But they knew where they were. And the interesting part of that is this ties that entire narrative back to the promises God made to the patriarchs long before to Joseph and his father, Jacob, and his father, Isaac, and his father, Abraham. All of those promises are tied by the taking of Joseph's bones as they leave the slavery of Egypt to journey to the promised land. This is God's redemption for his people. This is why Paul's able to write in Romans, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death is that slavery that Paul's been writing about earlier in the book. You are enslaved to sin until the death of Jesus is apportioned to you. And Jesus is explaining this to the, the, these two disciples on the road to Emmaus. He's explaining he had to die. There had to be some release from sin. Or else everybody who's a sinner will die on their own. And so the Israelites are set free. And what happens? Their journey takes them to our next vignette. They go through the waters of the Red Sea to the Promised Land. The, the waters seem to have stopped them. 
Here comes Pharaoh with the, the largest, most powerful army on earth, bearing down on the Israelites who are trapped by the Reed Sea. Now, you might read it Red Sea in your Bible. I'm not throwing in an extra E. It actually is a sea of reeds. It's just some translators believe that it's referencing the Red Sea. Others um, uh, do not. Jim Hoffmeyer makes a great point of where he believes this is, and he's persuaded me as a great Egyptologist, but that's another day. The point is, they've got nowhere to go unless God provides a way. And so Moses, with the stick, waves the stick, and the hand of God and the breath of God part the waters, and the Israelites go through the waters on dry land. Paul says to the Corinthians, I don't want you to be unaware, brothers. Our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. There is symbolized in that event the baptism that's become a mainstay of the Christian church ever since Jesus. Uh, at the time of Jesus, uh, most Jews would, would do a ritual of baptism themselves, the mikvah, the, the Jewish baptistry, or for John the Baptist, out into the water. And it would be a way of symbolizing washing away impurities. John put a, a special particular spin on it and called it a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins because he was baptizing people who wanted to turn their minds and turn their hearts to God. Jesus was baptized to fulfill all righteousness, not because he needed to repent, but because he's affiliating with us and he is the, the, the one who leads the way through the Red Sea, the Reed Sea, the waters of baptism. And so all of these vignettes from the Old Testament speak out about what Jesus was going to be doing and how he would be doing it. As the, the, the Israelites get out in the wilderness, they were unfaithful, but they, they, they grumbled and complained because they weren't getting any food. They were hungry. So what does God do? God causes manna to come from heaven, and that's our next vignette. The manna from heaven falls down six days a week. Not on the seventh day, so they had to take a double dose on the sixth day because the seventh day is a Sabbath, a day of rest. But God provided sustenance for the people, food for the people. Jesus said this in the Gospel of John. He said, our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, it wasn't Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. It was my father. My father gives you the true bread from heaven, the bread of God, the true bread, the meaning of that whole manna story is he who comes down from heaven and gives life, not just to the Jews, Israelites wandering in the wilderness, but to the world. They said to him, sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me won't hunger. Whoever believes in me will not thirst. Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is our sustenance on this journey. If Jesus is with us, we are fed and well fed and we are alive and we are good. That's the bread of heaven that's descended down for us. That's why Jesus says, my body is this bread that's broken and given for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. And the Christian ceremony of the Eucharist remembers Jesus, uh, of the Lord's Supper, remembers Jesus giving his life that we might have life. Giving his body as the bread of life. Bread in Hebrew is the word lechem. Lechem. Hebrew word for house is bait or beth. 
Beit Lechem means house of bread. Bethlehem, as we would say it, means house of bread. The bread of life came through the house of bread, through Bethlehem, to redeem the world. Our next vignette is a vignette of God providing water as Moses strikes the stone for the thirsty people. And that water is also Jesus. As he said, no one will hunger, no one will thirst. Look at what he said in John 7, 37. This is on the last day of feast, the great day Jesus stands up and he cries out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow water, rivers of living water. Jesus is, is, is our food. He is our sustenance. He is, his spirit flows out of us and, and refreshes us and hydrates us and keeps us alive on the journey home. Which brings us to the next vignette. Moses goes up on Sinai and receives a covenant from God. We call it the Ten Commandments. We call it the law. But there was always a promise that there would be another covenant. And I'm going to talk about this next week in more detail because we're running out of time. But we're going to look at Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34 in some detail. And if we go to the IPVO for just a moment, Brent, we'll give everybody an idea of what we're going to be talking about. Here we are in the Old Testament. Now, this is an Old Testament prophet, Jeremiah. And he's writing five, six hundred years before Jesus. And he says, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke. Though I was their husband, but this is, by the way, that we'll talk about some of that next week, uh, but there's real neat understanding of that passage because I was their husband. But this is the covenant I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I'll put my law within them. I'll write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and his brother saying, know the Lord. For they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. That's the beauty of this. That is just a smattering of what happened on the road to Emmaus. I want to talk about that in more detail next week. I hope you'll join me for that. I want to talk about uh, uh, more passages that explain how Jesus was providing for the people. But for now, what I would like to do is just tell you that this road from tyranny to the promised land, the story of Moses is a story that's laced with layer upon layer upon layer of prophetic promise of what the Messiah would be who the Messiah would be, what the Messiah would do, and how the Messiah would change humanity's relationship with God. I'm delighted to tell you that, that this road from tyranny to the promised land is a road that the Lord has walked before us not just prophetically in the Old Testament, but in the New. And that's part of the story behind the story on the road to Emmaus. So next week, I'm really jazzed because next week, what we're going to do is more of the story behind the story on the road to Emmaus. We'll continue with Moses. We'll go through and begin to look at some of the other prophets. Between now and then, let me offer you this. If you would like more information about this or anything else, please feel free to email us, info at lanierfoundation.org. Uh, the, 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 the recipients of those emails are just two of us. It's me 
And Pastor David Fleming, who is the spiritual director uh, for our foundation, and uh, he had been my, my lead pastor for 13 years. He resigned from the pulpit uh, last year and uh, has spent his time since working with us in our, in our efforts through this ministry. And so if, if you would like more information, you can email us privately. We'll send you links to thoughts for the day that I'm trying to get done each day with the help of Pastor Brent Johnson and Janet Seifert. And then Janet does a mashup of those on Saturdays. I do them Monday through Friday. But we'll give you those links so you can watch those if you care to on YouTube. Uh, Pastor David it all, has also put together a, a big collection of the promises of God through Scripture and uh, uh, of God's victory in the midst of bad circumstances in Scripture and how reliable God is. And we're glad to send you those. And last, some of you may just have needs that, that you'd like prayed over. And I can tell you, those are, you can do it anonymously, but, but it's hard to be anonymous on the internet. If you've got something we can pray about, Pastor David, Pastor Brent, myself, just the three of us will see those and we will be delighted and honored to pray for you. But with that, let me ask God to bless you right now. And then we're off to enjoy Phil Keggy's latest contribution to our class as he does what he does so well. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to bless us. Give us spiritual insight. May your spirit open our eyes, clean out our ears, soften our hearts, quicken our minds. Help us, Father, to see your hand as the point of rescue in this world for us with everything that's going on, Father, all of the, the international pandemic, all of the uh, economic upheaval, may we focus our hearts and our minds on the redemption of Jesus from the tyranny of sin. We praise you for that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so here's your Phil Keggy song. I've got to tell you, this may be my favorite one he's done yet. I will remind you, he's not just singing this. He's recorded all of the instruments himself. He's played all of the instruments and sounds. He's mixed it. He's engineered it. He's done the whole thing except come up with the original. And I added the words. So it's from an iconic album. See if you can find this song in your memory. You ready? Here we go.
I asked Paul McCartney what he thought about this, and he said, two thumbs up. We'll see you all next week. God bless you.